Good. Okay. Well, look, what would you like me to do? Read from my notes. At whatever you like to do, really. It's Why it's don't we you. do that? Yeah. And you take as much as you like. Sure, sure. Then yeah. you may very well have questions. Yeah. So, Michael, uh, you know, before we start, yeah. I would really like to thank you, you know, for uh, you know, setting aside some time, oh. right, uh, to reflect with us on, you know, the Cambridge history of ancient China and, and the time in which it was written and uh, how the field, you know, has evolved uh, since. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering whether you could tell us a little bit about what lay behind the idea of putting that volume together at the time and 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 how how basically you know the whole initiative you know came into being well it started one day in the faculty club in the university of chicago where I invited, I was there as a visiting teacher, I invited Ed Shaughnessy to join me for a drink after the day's work. And after he drank a bit of whiskey, um, I broached the subject of doing this volume to take in history of China before Cambridge history itself started with Chin and Han, and it was determined to do that at a time when it wasn't really possible to think of history mm. before then. Then, of course, things moved on and it was possible. Anyway, I broached the subject to Ed after he'd had a whiskey or two. And and whiskey. Yes, <laughs> we got together and worked on it. And I should say, that really the greater part of the creative work in that volume was Ed's and not mine. Well, we put the idea together and that's how it produced. But I'm talking about 1990 when work in scholarly terms was of completely different order from what it is now. There was no use of machinery the whole time as a regular thing on which one would depend. And since then, research has extended into so many fields, so much more widely than one could think of at that time. And now, of course, it is possible to go into subjects which at that time one could think about, but only dream about. The scholars were working much more individually in the 1990s than they are nowadays. Look, now there are these very frequent groups of meetings, such as the one in Hong Kong itself. Mm. Uh, before 1990, oh, it was quite a thing to gather a meeting. Even in the European cities, yes. Oh no, it was quite a thing. You prepared for mm. it, you looked forward to mm -hmm. it. And if you were a young scholar, mm. that's where you set your mark. That's where you really showed yourself and tried to attract attention and, of course, tried to attract a job from some of the people who were there. Well, I was very conscious when I did broach the idea of this book to Ed Chauncey that enough progress had in fact been made and conclusions had been postulated to make it possible to do so. When the Cambridge History of China was set up, I think I'm right, in the 1960s, mm -hmm. nobody would have thought then of treating Pre Jin Han as history. Right. And so it was decided to start with Chin. And of course, there was the complete difference, thanks largely, I would 
steep myself to the work of uh, of Keatley, who right. made it possible to mm -hmm. think of pre and Shaughnessy. Uh, it made it possible to think of pre imperial times in historical terms. Well, at the same time, in 1990, there were the difficulties of combining the work and theories of specialists with one another, differing as they did. Some worked on precise assumptions, some on generalities. Attitude of the archaeologists was somewhat different from that of the historians. As we realized and therefore decided to form the volume in the way it is, with separate chapters by archaeologists matched by chapters by the historians. And there was, of course, this great difficulty in formulating. Something that could apply for such a long period. After all, what are we thinking of? Prehistory, mm. 1500 years. Yeah. Which, yeah. You know, yeah. To try and write in general mm -hmm. terms would be very difficult indeed. So, the form which we did evolve for the volume was to take the archaeological and historical inquiries in separate chapters side by side highly conscious as we were of the different approaches of the contributors whom we had persuaded to contribute. Some, there were the archaeologists and then the historians with completely different disciplines. Yeah. I wonder, Michael, could you say a bit about, you know, this relationship between archaeologists and textual scholars and how you have experienced that, you know, in your own, in your own career? I mean, have you seen developments there? Do, 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 is it, is it a happy marriage in your... In your sometimes community? anything but. One has felt that the archaeologists have sometimes heard them saying, of course, the archaeological record states such and such, and that is black and white for them. And um, those of us who deal with texts, of course, wouldn't dream of making such a bland statement. Mm -hmm. um, We'd, I noticed this very much when we were editing this volume. See. Some of, and um, we tried to find a compromise. Um, it became easier as time proceeded. For example, if we we're writing about John Gore, right. uh, you could put the two together much more easily. Mm -hmm than, say, for Joe Dynasty, mm -hmm. but... Um, and and in, <coughs> in which areas, you know, of, I suppose, our study of early Chinese society, do you feel that, you know, the archaeological evidence and textual evidence are, you know, most in tension with each other? If you just look at your the way in which you have used archaeological evidence and reports, where well, you find a distinction and a different. It's a difficult question to answer. Mm. I don't mm -hmm. know that I can. Yeah, yeah. It. One of the one of the. I suppose one of the arguments that archaeologists, you know, will make is that you, you know, unless you are materially literate, right, it's 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 very hard, you know, to uh, give due account, you know, of of you know, of a society. But yeah. then, to what extent can one be 
both materially literate and be in charge of the texts and master all those, you know, skills. Um, well, of course, one thinks back to our masters of the past. I'm thinking, uh, you make me think of Carl Brand, right? who I suppose was in many ways the nearest example yeah. we've got of somebody who could and did put them together. Yeah. Uh, Keatley was able to do so for right. Shang Dynasty. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that generation. And I would say Casey Jung mm -hmm. for Joe Dynasty yeah. showed the way to try and do these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, when, when it came down to, you know, when you start a project like this, yeah. you have to come up with themes. Call up themes and topics. You know, you have to have some kind of some kind of skeleton of what you want a volume to include. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did you go about making making the decision as to the themes that you felt in the 1990s were really, really important? Well, the volume on the whole is planned in chronological stages, isn't That's it? Right, yeah. Yeah. which in themselves brought different issues. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you raise a very important question that I've been wondering myself whether, as a result of this meeting, you're going to produce a second edition of this mm -hmm. or, or uh, a further thought, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whether it would in fact be possible to treat it on economic, Philosophical, yeah. to social yeah. terms. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure whether one could or not. I, mm -hmm. I don't know enough about the research for Joe and Chunchu John for that's gone on. Maybe, yeah. maybe you could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so economics, social history. Sure. I mean, those are sort of perceived gaps. Looking back on it. Um, or, or is that what was 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 the field simply not ready in a sense to? I, I, I think you're right. It it wasn't sufficiently ready. Right. And of course, there's this great difference if you're writing about Western Joe or late John Guo. Um, you can do things for late John Guo which you couldn't conceivably think of doing. Joe, simply yeah. because of the <coughs> type of material, type of source material which yeah. you have got yeah. at your disposal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you just think of the separate contributions of the volume, I mean, of course, they're quite they're quite different in their own way. I mean, there is there yeah. are you know there are very descriptive chapters. Yes. But there are also very interpretative chapters. You know, I think, I think about John Harper's chapter on natural, you know, natural philosophy as one of them. Um, and then there are also chapters one could argue, perhaps even in the 1990s, were already a little bit sort of traditional. I'm thinking here about the chapter on philosophy. You know, the the, the chapter by David Niverson, right? Do you know, we had problems over precisely that topic, and uh, right. neither Ed nor I would have approached right. it in the way that David did. Right. Right. It, anyway, that's there he was, yeah. the yeah. person to write about it. Yeah. Um, a very school school based sort of well, very kind of traditional yes. no, some account account of, uh, of uh, I think it's very likely that now a very different job could be made of that particular subject. Right. Right. 
Uh, it's, I don't know how far you could say economic history yeah. could ag would again be completely changed. Yeah. We didn't write a ch chapters on economic history of the time. Yeah. Could you do it now? In many mm. ways, I think you could, yeah. thanks to archaeology yeah. and better understanding of the texts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, of course, for your Chin and Han volume, the 1985 volume, you did economics, right? We did, we did include it. You, yeah. you did include yes. it, right? Yes. In, 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 uh... And there again, we've produced a supplementary volume to that. That's is... right. Yeah. Some years yeah. later. Yeah. No, I think the time certainly has come to produce a, I won't say a revised volume of this, but a, a new volume, a new approach. Yeah. Um, so much more research has been done. Um, and the, the whole question prehistory, too, I have no doubt what we wrote then is quite out of date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you think back about that period, you know, I mean, those two or three years, you know, like both working, you know, on the volume in Cambridge, you know, with Ed Shaughnessy, soliciting the contributions, you know, editing and revising. Uh, <clears throat> What are your fondest memories of that period in as an editor, you know, like working with the materials? What 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 are the parts of the volume that you felt sort of really, really drawn to? Because Well, it's some were easy to edit, some extremely difficult. Yeah. Um some of the contributors would receive no editorial changes or suggestions right at the cost of the of your life right others were glad to take note yeah difficult as of course if you had two people touching on the same subject yeah duplicating or contradicting each other yeah um one contributor, and I am not going to mention a name, who sent us, in fact, a transcript of a verbal lecture that had been given. Mm -hmm. Well, that made things awkward for the editors, as yeah. you could well imagine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, others, everything was there, absolutely finished. <laughs> no, no. If you wanted to change a full stop, a, a comma to a full stop, <laughs> oof. No, yeah. the author wouldn't dream of accepting it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if you, I'm, I'm very curious about this. You've edited and co-edited, you know, so many volumes and so many basic reference works over the years, and even, you know. Since the Cambridge history of ancient China, what are the skills that a good editor needs? Hey, I wish I had them. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, as as the first skill is to keep friendly relations with all contributors. That's right. Which may or may not be possible. You know, you raise a question, and somebody, and it raises hackles. What the devil's the editor doing? He doesn't know the first thing about this subject. I'm the scholar who does. Uh, occasionally one met that sort of approach. Yeah. Not frequently, but um, not easy to handle. And uh, I suppose, let me put it this way, suppose you had two people taking completely different views mm -hmm. of economic development or whatever it would be, uh, what does the editor do? Just leave them stated in the cold or does he refer? Yeah. It's... And, and to what extent back then did you insist on people using the same 
editions of oh, texts and, we, and basic basic sources. We had to do that, and right. uh, that meant quite a lot of editorial effort. If somebody just damn well didn't do it, right? So uh, we had to work it out, which was a curse and a nuisance. Mm -hmm. If you, I mean. When we are twenty years on from that volume, and uh, thirty, twenty, twenty, we're twenty years on, you know, since, since publication, since publication of the volume, thirty since thirty since yeah. the concept, since its conception, right? You know, which you know, which is obviously you know a, a significant, a significant in a period of time. Um, <clears throat> what has been, you know, the sort of most exciting aspect, you know, of you know, the study of early China that has kept you busy since. What is what 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 is what is what has fascinated you most? I mean, having gone through three generations, four generations of scholarship, well, in the last so the la the past twenty years, um, <clears throat> you see, you're really putting me in mind of the same question, not just for 20 years, but since the time when I joined academic yeah. life, yeah. 1956, mm -hmm. um, when God help us, School of Oriental and African Studies, a number of scholars in Chinese subjects, two of us, not in the Department of Chinese, but in the History Department, one for modern China, Jack Gray, one for pre-modern China. Um, well, sorry, I've lost the drift of your question. Or just talk about what it what yeah what, what it what pulled you to uh it's, it, and I was thinking of the way the subjects has developed yeah, the way you yeah, can look at it yeah, yeah. in those from those early times yeah and my God the changes uh, when all right you read a book about the history of China the Joe dynasty yeah. treated just like that yeah. As one unit, yeah. Um, what 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 drew you to the Han Dynasty? I mean, when uh, you when when you start off, and you know, we all make choices about yeah, yeah. about how did you how did you? Well, I felt. Look, you're talking. What was I thinking in the nineteen fifties? I took my degree in London. I think nineteen fifty one. I can't quite remember. I decided that no pre imperial history for me, I wasn't really interested in vitally. Mm -hmm. Anything after Han, I decided, well, you've probably got to learn Sanskrit. I see, right. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so there we were in these early imperial times. Yeah, yeah. When I felt I could cope. Now, written material then, you, all your working life, had the punctuated editions of the histories. Oh no, mm. we had the Bonabon or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, you have had your modern dictionaries. Mm. We had the Tsuhai and the Tsuyuan. Mm. And, um, do you know what I mean by the Harvard Yinjing indexes? Concordances, yeah. They're Concordances. Still used. Yeah. Yeah. Used. <laughs> well, uh, you can see what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. Um, it, what I benefited from very greatly, and I would like to stress this, was the help, the great confidence I received from Tone Hulsevi. Right. Um, yeah, at Leiden. In Leiden. Yeah. Uh, also, do you know his writings on Han's history on law? 
course. and many other things yeah. too. And um, he was the nearest um, colleague in the subject. Yeah. Yeah. Whom I had. And yeah. We used to meet every six months or so, either here or yeah. there. Yeah. 